only with reference to Reva, whether he knew she was in the toilet at the time he fired the shots. And is that not a misdirection of law? I, I submit not Because she goes on to immediately find that this court does not support the state's convention this, that this could be dos eventualis. On the contrary, the evidence shows from the onset that the accused believed that at the time he fired the shots into the toilet door, the deceased was in the bedroom. But he can be convicted of murder on the basis of dolus eventualis, even if he did think that she was in the bedroom, because his criminal intent is defined as the person, whoever that person might be, in the toilet cubicle. So was this not a misdirection of law? I, I, I submit not. And, and the reason why I say this, because that's one part of her finding, and it must be read with her factual findings before you can't, it can't be isolated with respect, Justice Leach. And if I may explain. Well, I need some explanation yes. as to why what she says is the test that she has to deal with with those yeah. eventualness can be correct. If it seems to me to be not. If, if I may first summarize, and then I will go yes. back in more detail. The trial court, in analyzing the evidence, first rejected yes. the Dolus Directus approach. Yes. And in finding there, she found, made two crucial factual findings. The one factual finding was that he genuinely believed that he was in danger. That's the one factual finding. The second factual finding. Well, I'm not sure if that is so, but let, if you can draw me. I, I will refer to the passages of the, of the findings. But let's accept that. If I may it. just yes. give an overall approach. Yes. So the one factual finding that she made is that he genuinely believed that he was in danger and was acting in danger. The second factual finding was that he genuinely believed that the deceased was at the time of the firing of the shots in the bedroom. Yes. And, and that can't be ignored, those two factual findings. No, I understand that. Now, it was in the context of that, when she considered dolus eventualis to say, because it can't be isolated from the state of mind of the uh, Respondent, and that's why she correctly, she absolutely correctly referred to error in persona or error in objector, but say that that's not what it's all about. Because if I may use an example, if I shoot someone thinking it's A that's going to attack me, and I really believed I'm under attack, error in objecto does not come into it. Whether the person was A or B or C, it does not matter. And that's what the trial court was at pains to say. She said, I look at error in objecto and I understand. I understand the principle of error in objecto if I shoot someone and I have a mistaken identity, that an identity that in itself cannot be a defense. Which makes my difficulty even more pronounced, that she did correctly set that out earlier, but when she comes here, and this is her finding. These two pages are the findings upon which the whole case turns, insofar as Dolus Eventualis. She never deals with anything effectively but Dolus Eventualis is excluded because he did not know that she was behind the door. That, that's on the one point, but it cannot be isolated with respect, Justice Leach. If, if I may take you to. Your analysis. You see, I accept the two premises that you say she'd already just found. But in the light of that finding, her analysis of Dolus Deventualis, it seems to me, is wrong. I, I, I think that. Because the issue was not then whether Riva was behind the cube, was whether he knew Riva was in the cubicle. The issue was he knew. A person was in the cubicle. But, but, but I, I respectfully submit that, that not, that's not even the issue. If, if of you, course it's the issue. If you would allow me just to take it back to the two factual findings. Yeah. And assuming that the factual finding is that he shot because of a perceived danger. If, that is a different if, issue. If that's the factual no, finding. The issue of whether there was the so-called putative self-defense which has been bandied around is something else. We're talking about intent, not unlawfulness. Putative self-defense has to do, well, self-defense has to do with unlawfulness. 
putative self-defense has to do with culpability. But we're talking about intent as to what was foreseeable. But, but that's exactly the point, that I'm, the submission I'm making, Justice Lees. I, I submit that you, you cannot, from that piece of the finding, cannot isolate the factual finding that he genuinely believed that he acted in danger. No, but that, let's not get sidetracked by that. When he fired the bullets, did he know there was somebody behind the door? Well, if I may use a different example, Justice Lees, I, I walk to a place and I fire shots through a door. Yes. I know there's a person and of course I'm guilty. Of course I'm guilty. Unless I say I fired those shots because I believed I was right in firing the shots. Yes, no, I understand that. But, but, but that, goes, that goes to the question of culpability. What we're dealing here with is the assessment of whether he, not, and culpability in appreciation of whether he acted lawfully. That is not what is dealt with here. What is dealt with here is whether he foresaw. I, 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 and, I take and, the, and, the, and as I read the judgment, the judgment, and you must point out to me where I'm wrong, he says it is not dolus eventualis because she, he did not foresee that it was Riva. Just as, if, if, if I may explain it in this way, make the submission, and I come back to what I've submitted. Just for present purposes, accepting that a factual finding was that he believed that he acted in defense. It follows that there's one substantial ingredient absent in his actions for liability, and that is that he believed that he acted lawfully. There was no intention to act unlawfully or the knowledge of unlawfulness. So that's missing. And that was the judge's approach. And, and it must be read with that. So it was defining by the trial court to say, that is my factual finding. Now, when I now look at dolus eventualis, I need to consider two further questions. Because what I do not need to consider what I do not need to consider, once I find that there was an absence to act unlawfully, it does not really matter who was behind the door, save for the following. And that's where the finding comes in. She says, or the court, I'm sorry, I apologize. The court says, there is of course one instance, and it's not in so many words, but if you read the finding, there is of course one instance where you believe genuinely believe that you're firing shots at an intruder, but, but you foresee and reconcile the dolus eventualis that it might not be an intruder, it might be the deceased. And it's in that context that that, that passage must be understood. Where the judge, where the trial court found and say, I've already found now absence of one of the elements of the dolus but now I must go further. That in itself is not good enough. I must now consider even accepting that he lacked the necessary intent for murder. Did he not perhaps foresee that it was Riva in the toilet? The deceased, I'm sorry. And did he not reconcile himself? And in that context... Of, of once, if you gain to come with the defense of putative self-defense. And I think you're going to be hard pressed to bring the facts of this case within that. But if you do come with that, then it's a question of culpability. And that question of culpability wouldn't matter whether it's dolus directus or dolus indirectus. I, I agree. So it wouldn't be necessary if, if, they, if, as you said, there's already been some sort of finding that they, that Dolus, that, that it, there's a lack of culpability to read issue it. I mean, one just can read what the judgment says. But, but, but I, I can't, with respect, I can't take that part of the judgment and, and isolate it from everything else. And what I'm trying to submit is if you read it with a finding, what the, the trial court was really doing to say, well, I found now as a fact 
that there was a lack of intent to kill. But now I must consider, did he not perhaps think, because that's the intruder theory, and I give him points, I, I, I bring that finding out in his favor, on the facts. I do that. But now I must consider, did he not in the back of his mind entertain the thought that it could have been, or that it was perhaps, the deceased. And that's what she's doing there. She's, she's saying, I cannot find on Dolores Avenger in view of what she's found before. I cannot find that it was Dolores Avenger in the sense that he had Dolores Avenger vis-a-vis -vis the deceased because my factual finding is that when he fired the shots, thinking it was an intruder, he genuinely believed, he bona fide believed that the deceased was in the bedroom. And that is absolute un in law a correct finding on an analysis of a previous factual finding in relation to Douglas of Charles. But the court now moves on. The court is at that point busy dealing with Douglas of Charles. And the learned judge said, the question is, and then those are the two questions but, that she asked. But, but the, I fully agree with what the trial court was doing, Justice Bartman, if I may explain again. She's now already found that he genuinely believed he fired the shots at the intruder. Mm -hmm. That is now the end of the Dolus directors. Now she thinks with that finding in mind, is that good enough to absolve him from Dolus eventualis? And she says, well, Let's see, we know he was in the toilet, and I, and I will develop it, but let's see, could he not perhaps have thought in firing at the intruder that it was the deceased, and therefore his absence of knowledge of unlawfulness would not carry conviction right through. It would assist him, because if he thought within the time, uh, the, the, the frames of Dolus Eventualis, if he thought that it might be the deceased in the bathroom, it would not assist him that he genuinely believed that he fired shots at an intruder because that would only assist him in respect of Dolus directors. Therefore, if I look at Dolus Eventualis, I now narrow the question. I've already made my factual finding. I now narrow the question in relation to the deceased, and I say, I cannot find Dolores de Vincialis because my factual finding is that he genuinely believed that she was in the bedroom. It's in that context, and, and that makes sense to me. Yeah, but that but makes but identity, sorry. sorry, that makes identity part of the inquiry. It, it, it does not with respect, and if I, if I may explain my submission. The identity, if, if 3224 was just meant for a quick, Complete acquittal, why can't 3221 with respect not also give rise to a complete acquittal? Well, if, if you can introduce the state's question of law there. Sorry, I'm not quite with you there. If I may repeat the submission. Yes, I just need to understand this. Why, why do you say that 3221 then can't apply in, in where the state appeals on a point of law, where there's been a conviction? Where there's a conviction? Yes. Not a complete acquittal, but a conviction. It applies, but it's not, it doesn't apply to the state. Yes, but why? It says in a case of a, a conviction, the state would not appeal in a case of a conviction. Why, why would the state appeal? It, it's okay. clearly meant with respect to my, my interpretation to say there's the accused is an appeal against conviction. The state does, does not have that right to appeal against conviction. No, no, but, but you must read it further. Or of any question of law reserved. I, I and question of law reserved refers to section 319. And section 319, and we know the history of that, of that section in previous acts. Section 319 specifically envisages the reservation of a question of law either at the instance of the accused or by the prosecutor. And so I also, like my brother, don't understand how you get to this argument that 3221 two and three apply only on your interpretation in the instance of the accused. I don't understand well, if, if we look at, if I may start at the back with respect, uh, Justice Majid, if you look at the back and you look at the proviso following sub one, it says provided that 
and it only deals with the accused there. And sub 3 only deals with the accused. It does not deal with the position of the state. That's why. Whilst when you get to 4, why it do deals... You say that? What is the, how does the proviso affect it? How does the proviso affect it? The only submission we make in this regard, if you look at the proviso, the proviso has no relevance to the state. Why? Precisely. It, it deals with, it says, when a point is decided in favour of an accused, and then it tells you what the court must do and may not do. But and Mr. the Ruh, second so one is where there's a conviction that's only sorry, the accused. I, sorry, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but this is exactly the point. What the proviso does, it makes provision for a certain set of circumstances that may arise where the, ca the court finds for the accused. It has no bearing on the, on, the, on the prosecutor. It doesn't mention the prosecutor because it doesn't affect the prosecutor. That, that does not mean, it does not follow, therefore, that the prosecutors are included in one, two, and three. I'm, I'm having difficulty following your argument. You see what I'm saying? This is, is in to make provision for a set of circumstances that may arise where the, where the accused is successful in raising the point of law. I, it says the conviction on sentence shall not necessarily be set aside. I, one I, can understand that from a practical point of view. We know how criminal trials go. Justice Majid, I understand that, but if I may, if I may, if I may, may go back to 3221 to the word question of law, and I understand where question of law comes from, but so does question of law in sub folk come from, and that's from 319. But that question of law can also incorporate a complete acquittal. It does not say in the question of law other than in the case of a complete acquittal. And for that reason, we say, if you look at it, if you look at one, two, and three, and it's not without any constraint, it's not that I stand with absolute clarity, I don't. But if I look at that, my interpretation of that is, and that's been the interpretation by courts before, and so that's the only thing you can do. Rosenthal say, that's why 313693 is on the book now. That's why they brought it in, also to deal with the position of the state. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what puzzles me the most on that argument. It's section 324. Do you have any explanation for why six, section 324 only deals with procedural, as a layperson would call it, technical? Technical difficulties. Yes. You see, that's what that puzzles me the most. If, if and, and there one can understand again why in the interest of justice the legislature has decided you cannot get, you cannot let an accused go off scot-free on a technicality, and I'm speaking layperson's language now. And therefore, there should be a retrial. <coughs> Conversely, if you've had a full trial and there's been some mistake of law, the state now reserves questions of law and this court on appeal finds for the state. You've had all the evidence. And therefore, why can't this court forget about, I, I take your point that it's dis disjunctive. Why can't the court in terms of 3221C say, in the interest of justice, it's not in anybody's interest, let alone the accused, to have another retrial, given what's gone before. And therefore, this court now decides on the record before it uh, what, the, what, the, what the judgment should have been. I, I, Sorry, I've said a mouthful. Uh, I understood. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Bajji. I think that if one interprets Section 324, one would see that it's really designed for an error. And I believe that the legal point is designed, a consideration of the legal point three, for an error. So it's compatible. Well, not only an error, a technical error, isn't it? Yes. But it's a technical, a technical error. Well, it's, it, it talks about the technical irregularity. Now, technical irregularity, it's a wide concept, whatever it means. Let's say, let's say, let's say the main witness. I'll tell you what that means, in my view. I may be wrong. What that means is, let's say the only eyewitness to the offense was a child. And that child wasn't properly warned in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act before giving evidence. And the judge and assessors, as the case may be, accepts that evidence. And that's the only incriminating evidence. The court is satisfied that that child's evidence is sufficient as a single witness. Or there's other corroboration. But that child wasn't properly warned or admonished in terms of the act. That's the sort of error that comes in here, isn't it? 
Here we're talking something different. We're talking, for example, and I'm not saying that's going to be the finding, but let's say, for example, we find that the principles of the Holy Jalas has been incorrectly applied, and that's an error of law. That's on the merits, isn't it? It's not a technical error. It's an error on the merits. Uh, that's how I understand the section, because it does puzzle me why this section deals with the sort of things that we would... The court doesn't, didn't have the competence to convict, for example. It's not, it's not, a, it's not an offence over which that court had jurisdiction to convict, for example, treason. Well, I, I, I you understand what I'm saying? I, I, I fully understand, Justice Majid. I, I, think, I think with 3224, with respect what the legislature had in mind, and maybe not with this soberest, most soberest thinking that you can dream of, was to say, well, I am going to afford to the state, I'm going to make it possible for the court to, to order a retrial without possibly scrutinizing the individual content in 324, because 324 is foreign in the sense that it's, it's very difficult to force it into a sum of some findings that may follow on that point of law. Now, you would also know on, on the law on interpretation of a statute. Here, the legislature has stipulated A, B, C. When A, B, and C happens in a trial, the consequence shall be proceedings in respect of this may again be instituted. There's a numerous clauses. It's not, it doesn't say, or any other matter where the interests of justice require. It specifically mentions those three aspects. And I say again, those are technical defects in procedure. Mr. Roo, maybe our final judgment, State versus E, 1979 3, which deals with the point. I'll read the head note. It says, where court of appeal is convinced that the trial court, because of a wrong finding of fact or of a mistake of law, convicted the appellant of a less serious offense than that which, in terms of the indictment, he should, be, should have been convicted of. The Court of Appeal has the power, in terms of Section 322 of Act 51 of 77, to alter the conviction accordingly. In such a case, the Court of Appeal has the power to set aside the sentence of consent and either refer the case to the trial court for that court to impose an appropriate sentence or itself impose a sentence. That, 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 that's true, Justice McClantla, and I've, I've seen another case as well where they did not motivate it, but where it happened. But then I also see cases where it tells you that the only step that you can follow is that it's difficult. Well, it's a matter of interpretation. It, it's a matter of interpretation. If the interpretation is that 3221 is not only limited to a legal question of law by the state, then it must follow, of course. Then it must follow that the court can apply 322. I, I have a difficulty just to understand 3224 then, what the purpose of 3224 was. Because if a wide interpretation is given to 3221, why, why, why introduce 3224 on, 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 in the act? Because then you can read a legal question also has to be one that would, that would uh, follow an acquittal, maybe a complete maybe acquittal. Maybe, said maybe spoke. the intention was to make quite sure that if there was a decision was exercised under 322.4, the accused then couldn't raise a plea of autrefois. That may be, and I think a second... But you see, we're we not dealing with an acquittal, but a conviction, but possibly an incorrect conviction. And if you accept that the court would be bound, the appeal court would be bound on the factual findings that are made, but there was an error of law made, then there would be no purpose in starting de novo. And one shouldn't exercise your discretion then under 3224, but you just make the order that should have been made. Yeah, I, I, I understand that just as legit. And it would might, in a, in a position like this, operate in a in uh, an accused's favour, where factual findings have been made that uh, an accused person might be very happy that they were made and not uh, made in favour of the state on certain issues. But then the court is bound by those factual issues, but mainly takes the, the final decision that should have been made. Take, for instance, this case. There's been an inference drawn in so far as Dolus. 
if there's been dolus um, uh, eventualis, if the court finds, that, for instance, that it shouldn't have been uh, culpa, that it was a question of dolus, you don't want to have the whole thing referred back to start de novo to go through the whole trial again. Um, it's far easier to say these are the factual, dis uh, so the factual, this is the factual matrix. There was an error of law. So the, the, find, the only factual thing that we began to interfere with was the drawing of the inference that, and draw the correct inference. Justice Leach, I, I, I try to, to make it plain that we also, from our side, we have a difficulty with the interpretation. I could simply give you the yeah. two interpretations. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. I, I understand that interpretation. There are two interpretations. What complicated it is, of course, by virtue of previous decisions of this court, indicating to us that's the only thing that can yeah. happen. No, but, I, I, but it's open. It is indeed open. If I may just come back to the merits on one point. Yeah. Well, can I just add, before you go to the merits, it's interesting that, I mean, my colleague has referred to your state as E, but in commentary at 31-39, when the, when the authors deal commentary in the Criminal Procedure Act, when they deal with the powers of the Supreme Court of Appeal, if the question of law is decided in favor of the state, they say, they refer to the retrial, I quote State versus Rosenthal, as you've done. But they also say the following, and I quote, if the record contains all the relevant information, the SCA may also use its powers pursuant to section 3221 and deliver the judgment and impose the sentence while we leave that aside that should have been delivered and imposed by the trial court if the latter court had correctly interpreted the legal position. But again, they quote no authority, so. I'm just mentioning it. Yeah, I, I saw that. If I may just refer to Pillar in this regard, where I thought, and again with great deference, Justice Mpati, mm -hmm. where I thought that that the powers really that the court derive were the powers provided for in the Section 22 of the High Court Act to interfere. If I may just go to that passage, it is. And I understand the facts there where there was an appeal and there were acquittals that, which were not really before the court. But, but there was in paragraph 114, it says, the powers of a court of appeal are derived from section 22 of the Supreme Court Act, which provides for that. And then section 322, and it's quoted, is then referenced to, and it says, the subsection clearly deals with the powers of a court of appeal may exercise in the instance of an appeal against a conviction or where a question of law has been reserved for its consideration, it does not give a court of appeal the power to alter acquittal order or to substitute it with the finding of guilty. I, I just bring that to the attention. I know my brother presiding was in that case, but they may have been wrong. <laughs> I will never dare to say that, uh, <laughs> Justice Mitch. <laughs> I just referred to that. If I may just come back to one point on the merits, and I, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but and leave the factual point behind. When one considers the case and the intention or the negligence, we submit that it cannot be considered by simply saying that you must look at his evidence where it was contradictory and for that reason rejected and find that he did not act in a perceived danger. Because that would so militate against the prevailing facts. It would so militate against all the evidence on record where we have this absolute anxiety that was not an issue where a psychologist appointed by the court tried to explain the two Oscars, and the one when it's 1.5 meter, and his fears, and his over fears, and his over anxiety, and that was also confirmed by Professor Foster, is his general anxiety disorder. And it's that person that you mistake, and see him hearing a noise, and with his fight response, not the flight response, because he cannot run without his legs on, on his thumbs. With that flight response going there and making observations in that condition, three o'clock in the morning, if you think that away, the question is why did he shoot? 
Did he just shoot because he decided this is a good time to fire shots into a door? It cannot be with respect. There was a trigger element for him, and that trigger element was a continuous one where he was standing there in that state of mind, and when he heard that noise, for him it was, that's it. That's it, they're coming out. And he says this on a couple of occasions. If you draw a line through that and say, that's nonsense, you're a liar, you're a poor witness, why did he shoot? Did he just go to the bathroom to fire shots into a door because it's practice time? It cannot be. But what also cannot be is that the court gave every person with an anxiety disorder a license to shoot. Absolutely not, and we're not asking for that. We say that's why we can't generalize. We say, let's look at this fact. Are those facts present? We're not saying you'd excuse from firing. That's why it's convicted. That's why it's convicted of culpable homicide, because he was not excused. But now to impute intention because he contradicted himself, where he was trying to explain his state of mind in very, very difficult situations, is also not fair. So we're not saying walk away. There was no appeal against the culpable homicide. There's no exclusion of liability, but to say that that person went there, and why did he then shoot? If it was not that he was in that anxious moment, overreacting, but one in his shot. mind. One shot, yes. But it's, we're not talking about one shot where you have a trained person. You shoot, the evidence was in quick succession. Do, 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 do. That's what it was. You trained and you fire shots in quick succession. And you should have thought better. Yes, of course. You should not have fired four shots. You should not have fired shots at all. But that does not impact of what his mind was thinking. And that's what the case law, the way I understand the case law, is at pains to say, be careful not to say what he should have thought. Look at his state of mind. And all we say when you look at his state of mind, you cannot isolate it from who the person is. How do you say this case differs from State versus Dolavira? Uh, How does this case differ from State versus Dolavira? Where the man saw a number of persons in his yard, in an area which was prone to housebreaking, crime and so on, and he fired. And the court found there was no, and the objective facts, there was no imminent danger, and found him guilty on dollars of insurance. But the court, the court, the court rejected his version. The court rejected his credibility. That's the difference. Here we have a very different case. We cannot just, with respect, take the one case and say there's a man with two legs standing there. It's not three o'clock in the morning. He doesn't feel he must protect someone. We have to look at this package. The package presented was very different. And, and in my understanding of the case law, however unreasonable you are, if that's really your frame of mind, that's your frame of mind, and the law is not designed to punish you for a wrong frame of no, mind. Well, what, what the law requires is that you must investigate whether he, uh, whether he did, in fact, hold a genuine belief in the circumstances of the case. But if not, if he did not hold a genuine belief, what would one say with respect? Why would he have fired? Are we going back to the state's version that he wanted to kill the deceased, which cannot be, which was tested and rejected? It cannot be. Something must have happened in that man's mind that caused him to fire, and he explains that. If you think that away, there's no answer. There's just a person going three o'clock in the morning to the bathroom and five, four shots on the door. Something must have happened, and he explains this, and the background facts explain it. The experts explain it. It's the package. And it's unfair then to take him and see him now through a prism of someone else standing there at 10 o'clock at night or whenever with two legs on. We have this anxious person, the overly anxious person. We see Dr. Derman's, Professor Derman's evidence where with all the para-athletes, he scored the highest on anxiety. That's the evidence. He's overly anxious. Incorrectly so. But that's who he is. And he stands there, and he's scared, and he sees the open window. That's what the trial judge was saying. He could see this objective corroboration for him. It's not that the window that he heard was opening was now suddenly closed. It's an objective fact. He's scared. He's really scared. He believes the deceased is in the bedroom because he's spoken to her before. When he woke up, he's spoken to her. 
So it's not that he believed she was sleeping there. He knew she was awake, but he knew she was in the bedroom. That's the finding. Now he fires. If it's not for that reason, and one tries to sit back and think, why did this man then fire the shots? There is no reason other than to accept the state's case, which cannot be, because it's inconsistent with the probabilities. It doesn't make sense. Then there's no reason, and that's unfair, to then impute him with no reason, say you're guilty. The state of mind is there, and it's consistent. But I'm revisiting the merits. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Reply, Mr. Uh, I have the submissions I wanted to make. You don't have Can them. I ask you something on this last point? <laughs> Which Mr. Roe has made very emphatically. If we, if we, if we either are not in a position to interfere with that finding, it being a factual finding, or we do, for some other reason, find that he did not have a genuine belief. What do you say is the reason he fired? He did not harbor a genuine belief that there was an intruder there. I'm postulating it on the basis of Mr. Roo's argument. I'm not saying that's my view. Justice Majid, there could be very many um, inferences drawn. There well, let me ask you this, let yeah. me ask you directly, because oh, this is yes. really what my question should have been in the first place. Is it necessary for us to find a reason? No, it's not necessary to find. But because if the, the very pertinent question you asked, Justice Majid, is the comparison between the two cases. We have to well, I must, I must say, of course, and you would know it as well as anybody else, that one must treat each case, especially when it comes to intent and unlawfulness in these sets of circumstances, each case must be decided on its own particular facts and circumstances. Indeed, but there, there, there remains a principle, Justice Majid. The principle is, in that particular matter, the court rejected his evidence. Our argument remains that in this particular matter, the, the evidence should have been rejected, but it, but it, it is not necessary it, to make the find. Well, it wasn't rejected. That's it the is point. not necessary to find why he shot. What we have to know is that <laughs> he did shoot in circumstances where he had foresight and he reconciled. That is the question that this court should ask itself, and that would be the end of the matter. Is the finding that he, that he had, did have a genuine belief that he was, that he was being threatened, um, is that not a factual finding which bounds the school? Uh, my and if it is, how does it affect your argument? I've got two submissions. Firstly, I say it's a factual finding, but it were, the factual finding was made in a wrong application of the law in terms of multiple defences, in terms of circumstantial evidence. If we cannot say that a factual finding wasn't made, it was made, but it was wrongly made. If it's wrongly made, the court can interfere. The second issue is, if the court finds th that there was a belief, then we still have to deal with all the aspects as far as Peter of self-defense that one should deal with. For instance, was there an alternative? Because the court wrongly applied the principle of Peter of self-defense, the court never asked itself the questions. Was the alternative? Was that the only way? Was there a genuine threat to his life? So those questions, because the, the court of quo asked the wrong questions, was never answered. And this court cannot answer them, because there's no version. As the court believes. Yes, thank you. Contrary to what I heard earlier in the day that judgment would be delivered today, judgment is reserved. <laughs> Court Lejeune. Maar dat gaan verloren staan.